Let me ask both of you, what makes quantum computers so vulnerable to error? Why are error mitigation techniques and fault tolerance so important? Well, one of the fundamental differences between classical information and quantum information is you can't look at a quantum state without disturbing it in some uncontrollable way. And even if we don't look at it ourselves, uh, we can't, even though we try, perfectly isolate quantum information that we want to process from the outside world. So the environment, so to speak, is observing it all the time. And that causes quantum computation to fail. It removes the magic of superposition that makes quantum computing powerful. So ideally, we would like to perfectly isolate the qubits that we're processing from the outside. And since that's not possible, uh, what we have learned theoretically is possible is to use the idea of quantum error correction to, um, in effect, protect the information by making it invisible to the environment. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because you wanted to know why we want to do it, not how we do it. Uh, we Look, we've um, quantum computing is really, really hard, Joe. <laughs> The idea that we can solve hard problems with quantum computers, it's 40 years old. Uh, Dave remembers uh, around the time he was starting graduate school, I guess, when we were first able to do quantum gates that could entangle uh, two qubits. That was about 25 years ago. And the hardware keeps, it, keeps advancing, but it's not nearly good enough. Um, it's much better than it was. And... Uh, I'm sure it will continue to advance, but to run applications that we're particularly excited about, we need far, far more reliable qubits, the key thing being being able to do highly accurate entangling gates uh, between pairs of qubits. And although we've gotten a lot better, the error rate in the best devices, multi-qubit devices, uh, is something like the 1% per operation level, maybe one in a thousand under ideal conditions, and it's just not nearly good enough. So either we're going to make much, much better hardware, and Dave told me when he was a postdoc, we were gonna do that with topological quantum computing. I don't know if you still think that. Uh, but um, in the absence of much, much better hardware, we are uh, expecting it'll be necessary to uh, correct errors at the software level. That's the idea of quantum error correction. Yeah, I find it useful to just talk about sort of sizes of things we can do today, right? So uh, I was reading the paper uh, last week where you know they were able to do a quantum computation with about 270 two qubit operations, which is a lot compared to what we could do a few years ago. But that's sort of about the size of what we can do before we start to get drowned out by noise. Um, and that's not a very useful, you know, that's sort of think about it. I, I think about it as just operations are doing by pencil and paper. You know, even I can write down, I probably handed it homework sets while I was at Caltech where I had to do 270 operations, right? Like not, that's not very much computation. And right now that's where our hardware, a lot of our hardware is sort of at. Um, but, you know, this miracle of air correction shows that, that, you know, if, if we, if we're, if we have sufficiently noise-free uh, initial sort of qubits, we can build up this, this larger structure to, to perform longer computations. Yeah, so both of you mentioned that, you know, hardware has been improving mm -hmm. and, you know, people have been still actively working on error correction. Um, and error correction was important, was known to be important even before the first uh, quantum computer was built. Um, do you think, do you think error, there's one, there's a family or one error correcting code that would serve all our needs? Or do you think we have to tailor codes to different systems? This is for you both. <laughs> oh, well, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> John, you just, wrote, you just wrote a paper on, I mean, you've written papers on the different ways of doing this. So I think I could get your answer. <laughs> well, look, um, we can think, talk about the, near term and the longer term. Um, there is an idea which is uh, also goes back over 20 
years about how to do quantum error correction, which sprung from the fertile imagination of Alexei Kataev, um, which, well, the principle of quantum error correction more broadly is that if we wanna protect quantum information, then we should store it in a highly entangled form. And entanglement has this wonderful feature that if you have a system of many qubits and they're entangled with one another, then you can store information in that many qubit system in such a way that when you look at just parts of the system, one at a time, a few qubits at a time, that information is completely invisible. And that's how we intend to fool the environment and prevent it from learning about the encoded state. And uh, Kataev's great idea was that we can imagine building materials that have that feature, that store information in that very highly entangled form that's well concealed. But he also pointed out that we don't necessarily have to make the material um, out of say a solid state system. We can in effect uh, simulate that material with any qubits of our choice. And 20 years or more later, that's still the best idea we have uh, to do quantum error correction. We, it's what we call the toric code or the surface code that Kataev invented. And it has some big advantages. One is that the processing that we need to do to uh, detect the errors is quite simple. It's geometrically local in two dimensions. So you can have the qubits laid out in the table on a table and just act on four neighboring qubits at once to learn about the errors. Um, and also it tolerates a relatively high error rate. And that's gonna be really important in the near term where we're trying to just barely uh, get below uh, the error rate that makes error correction possible, that makes it effective. And so in the near term, we don't have a better idea than the Torah code. Um, on the other hand, part of Kataev's insight was that we can do some of our error correction at the hardware level and then sort of clean up the rest of it at the software level. So I think increasingly in the future, we will take advantage of the principles of quantum error correction in the design of the, of the hardware. But I expect that, you know, over say the next five years where we hope we will see persuasive evidence that quantum error correction is working and seeing it steadily improving, it's probably gonna be uh, using the surface code.